online engagement here at Faith and Public Life. My colleague Kelsey Herbert, our Director of National Campaigns, is here as well, uh, as well as Rachel Brown and Samantha Owens from Over Zero. We're very grateful for your time and your presence today. Uh, and I see folks are saying hi in the chat. Uh, that is cool. Keep on doing that. Uh, and if you have or when you have questions or things to share as we go through this today, uh, using the Q&A, uh, the Q&A and chat boxes are good. Um, I, it's simpler to use uh, to keep content related questions in the Q&A box. Um, but with that, um, I'm eager to get started. And I, I, I know y'all are too. Um, so today we're going to be talking about building networks of resilience at a time of increased risk for election related violence. Um, I know a lot of folks on here today were on our previous webinar on messaging. We're really, really glad to have you back. Um, so as I said, uh, right when we got on, uh, we'll be sending out a link to the recording uh, and the slides and some resources afterward today. Uh, and during some share out portions of this where we want to facilitate just a very open dialogue, uh, we will pause the recording uh, so that anything we share, you know, your candid concerns and thoughts um, will be will be private uh, with the with the group that, that's here now. Before we get on with that, uh, I just wanted to say that, you know, at Faith in Public Life, we're grounding ourselves right now in a spirit of hope and resilience and resolve in the final weeks before this election. Um, every one of us here today is going to need hope, resilience, and resolve in these stressful last weeks. Um, and I think that we're all carrying a lot of heavy things right now. Uh, I know I'm not a lot alone in that, but we are carrying them together, and together we can protect each other by building peace. Um, so before uh, going into the content, I do want to just have a short moment of centering silence uh, to get us into uh, the place to deeply engage this work. Thank you. So we're holding this conversation today uh, because the United States is at a dangerous moment, uh, an elevated threat of politically related, politically targeted violence in the run up to the uh, election and the aftermath. Uh, I know just from memory and experience that in the final weeks, people can say things and do things and believe things that in normal times seem pretty out there. I think we all uh, recognize that, but what gives us a calm uh, spirit of hope and resilience and resolve is the belief that together we can build uh, a safer house uh, for, for everybody and that the most critical part of building that safer community, that's, that safer house, so to speak, um, is building our networks and planning and organizing now. Um, and to take that from an abstract, an abstract concept to a concrete plan. Uh, we're gonna be led by Rachel Brown and Samantha Owens from Over Zero. They're gonna lay out principles, they're gonna lay out practices, uh, and we'll, they'll present, and then we'll have some time for share out and discussion, uh, and then a little bit more presentation, and then some Q&A at the end. So with that, I will uh, hand it over to Rachel and Sam. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Dan and Faith in Public Life for having us and to everyone who is here to discuss this very important um, topic today. My name is Rachel Brown. I'm the founder and executive director of Over Zero and I'm joined by my colleague, Samantha Owens, who you'll hear from uh, shortly, she runs all of our United States programming. And both of us um, come from a background of working on preventing political violence. And we've worked in all different regions around the world. Um, Sam, for example, worked on different interventions in Bosnia while I've consulted on projects in places including Myanmar and Uganda. 
Um, I got my start from 2010 to 2014 with four years in Kenya working with local community peace activists to develop community-based approaches um, and prevent a recurrence of election violence um, that significantly um, harms the country in 2007-2008. For both of us, we see that the lessons and the knowledge from our work internationally um, are necessary and relevant for the US at this moment in time and during this election cycle. Our focus um, and collectively our team has more than a decade of experience focused here is really on the role that communication um, and that leadership plays uh, when there are these moments of high risk and volatility in either leading societies towards or away from violence. And those of you who have participated with us in faith and public life webinars and trainings um, will know that. Um, the work of this moment that we'll talk about today is around building a resilience network. We developed a toolkit that's really designed to equip leaders from different segments of society with the tools needed to build community resilience in the face of the myriad of risks that we, we currently face. And so today what we'll do is we'll walk you through the approach, the different steps, the contents of the toolkit, and then we're gonna work together to break some of that barrier to action um, by using uh, some reflection time and some group discussion uh, to put some of this thinking into action um, and take some baby steps along the way. So the question that really faces us in this moment, um, we really want to, to start with, with this particular approach. Why use this resiliency-based approach? Why focus on building networks of different stakeholders? Well, the reason why is that we can spend all day thinking about risks and different vulnerabilities. We can even map out potential events or potential flashpoints for violence or an escalation of division of dangerous rhetoric. But it's never ever possible to predict exactly when and how and where events will unfold. This is one of the characteristics of any time of increased risk, um, uncertainty and volatility. There is a lack of certainty. So while it's not possible to predict and plan for every exact possibility, what it is possible to do is to be prepared, to lay the groundwork and a strong foundation for coordinated and rapid action in the face of emerging tensions, events, and flashpoints for violence. And it's really critical to create the infrastructure and capacity to be responsive and adaptive to emerging dynamics in a moment such as this one. And I just wanna add here, that, that one thing that's so critical is that as Dan talked about, the need to be, to be hopeful, right? And to really have this more, more positive focus even when the world feels so challenging. Building a resiliency network is a tool to mitigate harms and to prevent violence, but it can also form the foundation for long-term proactive action. So I'll hand over to Sam to keep us going. So how, how do we do this? Um, so what we know, again, from both research and practice is that this resiliency network, this really strong infrastructure of coordinated relationships geared toward monitoring and responding to risks can really make a difference. So um, in our toolkit, which we've been referencing, um, we've, we've considered what's possible at this moment, as well as what can serve a longer term foundation, as Rachel has discussed. Um, and again, this means the idea of a uh, resiliency toolkit uh, or a resiliency network um, as outlined in the toolkit. And um, in developing this, we've drawn on our own work and we've drawn from um, research from early warning and response around the world and from studies that, that have shown when and why communities or er areas experience um, experience less violence than we would expect during times of heightened tension and conflict. So a resiliency network um, is comprised of cross-cutting relationships between leaders of diverse stakeholder groups. So local faith leaders, community leaders, influential individuals, elected officials, artists, and so on. And, and these different leaders are often connected to national networks with access to resources, skills, and capacities for mitigating violence. Um, these relationships uh, within this network are created and are anchored in 
a shared understanding of risk and a shared set of values around violence prevention, as well as a shared vision for moving away from violence. Um, this hope, right, this hope of moving away from violence and of really um, creating more resilient communities. And um, ideally, these networks build a foundation of proactive action. They aren't just responsive. Um, they don't just wait for, for risks to emerge or to worsen. They begin acting together in ways that reduce the risk of violence um, by really targeting those underlying dynamics and also start to build their muscle of coordination um, and collaboration through this proactive action. So we can go to the next one. Um, once, um, so what's a network like this exists? What can it do? Um, what does this actually look like? So a resiliency network can work to address existing forms of ongoing violence, um, respond to triggers and escalating events in ways that reduce the potential for violence to unfold. Um, and if violence does occur, these networks can respond to mitigate the violence. This is critical because, as many of you know, violence itself left unaddressed can serve to beget more violence and, and move communities and societies into spirals of violence. So violence often serves to justify and fuel calls for retribution and revenge, and violence itself becomes the rationale for more violence. And finally, these networks can, can also address the immediate impacts of violence um, and the harms that it has caused. So before we move into the steps of this approach, um, we wanna pause and really note the unique power of faith leaders. Um, so, you know, all of you on this call, we have seen both in the US and around the world, how faith leaders have really spearheaded these networks. And we know many of you on the call today already have robust networks um, of, of fellow leaders from across faith communities and your communities at large. And that means many of you that you, you may have a different name for it, um, already have a resiliency network in practice or the foundation from which to build one. It also means that you're already well positioned to build the structures for action that we're going to talk about and to take proactive action to mitigate underlying risk factors for violence. So what's the first step in this, in this process? The first step is um, building or bolstering your network. Um, it's about making sure you have the necessary relationships in place. This includes taking stock of your existing network, which leaders and stakeholders are you already connected with, which aren't you connected with. And really critical to this step is to ensure that you are connected to groups who are already facing marginalization, discrimination, violence, groups who have historically faced these challenges or groups who are at risk of, of facing these challenges in the future. It's also really important to consider who has been doing this long-term work, as well as other influential leaders and people who play a major role in the communication ecosystem of your community. And this is critical in order to develop a platform with which you're able to truly um, both learn from and influence multiple segments of a society and to do so in, and a community and to do so in a coordinated way. So again, this really is about laying the foundation for collaborative action by ensuring that you have the connections necessary. This might mean reaching out to organizations re representing different marginalized groups, to faith leaders you haven't connected with yet, um, elected officials, and so on. And with really limited time right now, we are suggesting that groups do at least a review of their connections and where they have gaps, and at least reach out to new groups that they don't um, already have close relationships with to establish contact and ideally learn about any efforts that others are also taking um, in this moment. So um, having at least this initial conversation before something happens really matters. So the next step is once you have your network, and we know many of you here already have strong networks, again, that you're starting from, um, it's important to get on the same page. 
So you can work together to analyze sources of risk and resilience. Um, you can do this very thoroughly, um, you know, with chart paper and, um, you know, hours and hours blocked off. Um, or you can do it through a simple conversation. But having some sort of shared understanding really goes a long way. Then you can take stock of your uh, collective capacities for response. This includes considering which audiences different people in your network can reach and how they can reach them. So who in your network has influence with different groups of people? Who has a Facebook page or presence? Who has a text chain um, with a lot of influential people? Does anyone have media contacts that um, they can use to promote public statements or uh, through news stories? Uh, does anyone have access to um, key decision makers? It's also important to take stock of what types of skills and capacities for response you have or you could gain access to. So um, it, does someone in your network have mediation training, um, social media skills, training on nonviolence? Um, what type of people, what type of knowledge do people in the network um, have and who has, who has access to different data sources? So who is able to, you know, really get a sense of what's going on amongst different communities? And then also who has access to in-kind support? So um, material resources or, or things like a physical space to organize. Understanding your different audiences um, and the different audiences your network can reach and the different capacities for response can really help you mobilize more quickly in the face of different threats or on the flip side, um, if there's a positive threat happening um, to really be able to run with that positive threat in your community. to take three minutes um, to answer the, uh, the, the prompts on this slide. So thinking through a few simple steps to expand our networks, as well as thinking about the basics of a communication infrastructure. In other words, how we make sure the lines of communication stay open um, throughout the election cycle. Um, once everyone takes about three minutes filling these out, we will have a facilitated share back with different folks who are, um, who are looking to share or, or willing to share um, what they come up with. So um, with that said, we will set the timer for three minutes um, and then get back together as a big group for a share out. Well, you've, you've brought us home, Elise. <laughs> um, that's a, yeah, that's exactly the point, right? Is we're in this contentious moment. We're in this moment where people are really looking for um, support. People are really looking to make those connections. I mean, I think, I think a lot of folks, particularly in, in communities who um, have been marginalized or targeted with violence in the past or who are most at risk um, for that, um, 
throughout the election season um, really are, it's really important to make those connections now, which you've spoken to. Um, and, and to rekindle those connections that you've made previously. And I think given the unique nature of the moment we're in, um, there is that sort of built in appeal, you know, um, there is that built in, um, reason to reach out. There's that built in, um, camaraderie that can go with really wanting to prepare your communities. Um, so I think everything um, Elise just said is, is, you know, exactly what we're getting at. The, the, this is the moment to both rekindle new old connections, to, um, to build new connections, and what everybody spoke to, which is re uh, reaching out across your network for, um, you know, deepening connections that already exist. We've heard a lot of that about deepening connections, but also making contact for the first time. And I know, um, you know, that can be really, that can be intimidating. Um, and just thinking about, you know, sending a message to someone you don't know, sending, calling someone you don't know. I mean, I don't know a single person in the world who enjoys cold calling, but, um, but you do have that that built in um, camaraderie and reason for connection that Elise was just speaking to. So thank you so much for that. Um, we are going to uh, continue along with the different steps of our approach. And um, I will hand it back to Rachel, who will take us into the second half of, of what we're looking at when we're looking at really building and mobilizing a uh, resiliency network. And I do have to start by saying that I'm someone who enjoys cold calling. So, um, so I guess I, I, I broke that rule. But um, really, I, I want to just echo what Sam just said, that it's really amazing to hear all of your thinking. And as we continue going through these steps, I just want to reiterate, we will be sharing out, um, Faith in Public Life will be sharing out this whole toolkit. And hopefully us walking through you, through it with you all like this, and um, everyone's starting to share some initial brainstorming. Um, like we said, we wanna take some baby steps together today and start thinking together because um, it can be intimidating to say, how do I map a network? But actually you, you've already done it just in these last few minutes, right? Start thinking about those connections. So really thank you for sharing. Um, so moving to the next step, once you've sort of figured out what does this network look like where are the connections? What are our sources of resilience? What are the resources we have at our disposal um, to, to build peace in our community, um, to respond to any tensions or risks? The next step is to really actually think about how to monitor events and how to coordinate and make decisions when responding to any crises. Um, and this can be as formal as in, or as informal as is possible, given the time allotted, but it's really important to at least think through it. So we include tools in the toolkit for doing some really basic scenario planning and building a decision-making process for response. Thinking through what might happen and how you might mobilize can be really helpful for thinking through concrete details. It can spark ideas, um, things like just building a simple phone tree of who's gonna call who to coordinate action. And it can help you think about how you'll communicate in real time and who you'll communicate with. Um, if events unfold. It can also be really helpful to think about who will have access to different type of information if threats emerge. And again, just even going through the exercise of thinking through with a few different people, a few different stakeholders, how you might respond together um, if different scenarios unfold can, can really help you build this muscle for response in real time. So we also really recommend um, getting familiar with some best practices for rapid response messaging prior to a crisis. So reviewing those tools that we went through last time um, and, and really familiarizing yourself with them. Um, and I'll note again that all of this is in the toolkit if you wanna go deeper um, and that it's especially important to build an understanding of things that you want to avoid so that you don't inadvertently fuel harm in a moment of crisis. Um, and again, so I won't go into these do's and don'ts of rapid response communication right now because we did do this um, last week and it's in the toolkit, but I, I again want to emphasize the importance of really thinking about that before anything happens. So when we're talking about coordinating for response, there's a question here of what exactly does response look like? Um, and this depends on, on what scenarios emerge, on what happens. 
Is it conflict between two different groups of protesters? Is it intimidation at a polling station, a hate crime? Different types of rapid response can include things like channeling support to communities that have been targeted with violence. In the case of a hate crime, we've seen community responses from providing new space, spaces for worship to statements of support to showing up to be physically there. We saw this with members of Faith in Public Life's network in Columbus, with Dan Clark and Horstead Noah working with other faith leaders to protect a mosque from intimidation by an armed group. When doing this type of response, it's of course important to first understand from community leaders how they want the network to show up for them. So again, if you're thinking through scenarios, you could think about how are we gonna be in touch with the people most affected and, and learn from them and really take their lead on a response. Responses can also seek to de-escalate tense situations with public statements combined with behind the scenes talks with key decision makers and influencers and outreach to each leader's own group to really move them away from escalation or from these cycles of revenge and retaliation that we've talked about. Leaders can also serve as channels to communicate across and between groups when tensions emerge. So kind of serving as a hub and a conductor of, of communication. And it can also be really important to reassert positive norms if we see incidents of violence to really show that there's local support for peace, for nonviolence, for supporting and showing up for each other. This list is of course not comprehensive, but um, it's really meant to be illustrative to show some of the breadth of what a network can do when it's set up to reach into different groups within a community, to mobilize different capacities for response, and to bring leaders um, together to coordinate and really leverage all the many capacities and the reach that they have. So I'll pass it back to Sam here. Yeah, so, um, so the final step um, is taking action. Um, taking proactive action. I don't have to tell you all how important that is. You're on this call, you're committed leaders. Um, in this specific, um, you know, with resiliency networks specifically, proactive action builds a foundation for rapid response. And it also gives a network practice working together. Um, uh, while while resting, while those responsive actions really rest on a solid foundation. Um, so what can this look like? What are we talking, you know, proactive action, taking action can feel pretty broad. We have a few key priorities that we go through in the toolkit that we will review today, um, especially when it comes to communication. And with each of those recommendations, we, we have an example of a community that has put this into practice. So first off, we want to um, really talk about building and strengthening unifying identities. So prioritizing building and strengthening unifying identities that really cut across the lines of conflict in your community can help undermine us versus them dynamics. Um, this can serve to both strengthen communities um, through different points of connection, but can also really reduce the negative social pressure to commit violence and other harms that we often see in moments of heightened tension and conflict. So an example of this that is of, you know, near and dear to my heart um, as someone who spent um, a lot of time working in Bosnia is Tuzla in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So ahead of the um, ahead of the war in Bosnia, ahead of the genocide um, of the early and mid 90s, um, the leadership in Tuzla, which is a, a city in central Bosnia that is very, um, is pretty evenly divided between ethnic groups. So uh, Serbs, Croats, and Bosniaks. Um, Based on the demographics, based on the location, the expectation for Tuzla would be that it had some of the um, worst violence um, areas, you know, cities that were geographically and demographically similar, um, often had some of the most horrific violence in the war. However, ahead of the war, the uh, city leadership really took um, the writing on the wall and the escalating tensions very seriously. Um, and saw uh, that tensions were really escalating along these ethnic lines. So what they did was they worked together, they worked across city leadership 
with um, leaders from different neighborhoods, different, you know, ethnic groups, different religious communities, and really built a Tuzlan identity and made this Tuzlan identity, um, you know, this is who we are. First, we're Tuzlan, really strong um, and really tied a, a value to being Tuzlan um, and, and helping neighbors and being strong as a community. They did this um, with, with songs, with rallies, um, with posters, and really worked hard to proactively get this message out. Um, before conflict erupted, and Tuzla actually, while it was while it was um, bombed by outside forces, the city itself did not turn on itself. So neighbors did not turn on neighbors the way um, the way we saw happen throughout the rest of Bosnia and Herzegovina. So next, we look to um, setting and maintaining strong positive norms that can really steer people toward positive action and away from harmful actions, um, especially in times of heightened pressure, you know, contentious times and uncertainty. Given your platforms as leaders within your community, your voices can really go a long way in setting positive norms. And I'll pass to Rachel for an example of what this looks like. Um, so we saw this play out a little bit in the Tuslin example, where the identity of Tusla was used to activate a common identity and enable people to have a different set of social pressures and social norms and expectations through their identity as Tuslin rather than within the conflict identities. And I want to point out that we are drawing on some pretty extreme examples here, right? Communities being resilient in the face of civil war and genocide. Um, and, and the point here is that even in more extreme situations, um, communities have been able to do this. And I think that that should serve as an inspiration. And this next example comes from the genocide in Rwanda, um, which had pretty high levels of civilian participation in part because of the massive pressure that was applied on um, on civilians to participate in the genocide or face consequences. And so the genocide was um, committed against um, the Tutsi mostly by um, Hutu power militias. But there is this one example um, of the Muslim community in Rwanda, which is rare throughout history, um, because we saw an entire community actually choose not to participate in the genocide, but beyond that, to actively rescue victims, provide safe harbor, and do so even at great risks to themselves. So prior to the genocide, the Muslim leadership um, in the country um, started to notice the rising tensions and the rising and, and dangerous rhetoric that was beginning to take root. The Muslim community was geographically and politically very separated and marginalized in the country as a whole, but it also included both Hutu and Tutsi. So the Muslim identity was a very strong identity that could cut across the different conflict lines. And the leaders really leveraged and mobilized that identity. And early on, when they saw those early signs of division, they started issuing public statements. They started including um, in their sermons at the mosque, at the, at the madrasas, at the schools, messaging that, that really leaned into the Quran, leaned into their identity as Muslim leaders and warned people not to participate ever in any violence against another group. When they heard these narratives um, of threats, these dangerous narratives, they told people, they talked of a time of temptation and talked about what it meant to be a good Muslim, that no matter what the temptation, they should never participate in violence and should always work together to save lives. Um, and so even as the genocide began to occur, the Muslim community actively collaborated with each other to do things like hide a potential victims in their homes, transfer them from house to house, fake mass burials um, so that they could trick Hutu militia um, while saving people, provide people shelter in mosques and refuse to separate um, based on uh, their identity as Hutu and Tutsi, even when militia showed up. Um, and asked them to. Some even faced death for doing this. So here we saw this strong normative expectation um, set by Muslim leadership using every single channel of communication they had access to um, from these in-person conversations to pastoral letters posted at mosques across the country, really mobilizing a norm that was able to actually compete um, with violence by rooting it into their faith, rooting it into their values, and letting people know that they could collaborate with their peers um, 
to work together to resist the genocide and actually engage in rescue. So I'll pass it on to Sam for the next, um, for the next priority, but really want to point out here the power of social norms and knowing that your group is going to act together and leaning into an identity. And I think faith leaders, just we see it all over the world, have a particularly powerful position to do this from. And this is, of course, a particularly powerful example um, where this group of faith leaders was able to say, no matter what pressures we're facing, no matter what rhetoric we're hearing, this is who we are and this is how we're going to engage. And it is a tremendous historical example of, of rescue and of, um, and of standing um, to core values in the face of, of large scale violence. Mm -hmm. So next is, is um, really encouraging and supporting action. Um, you know, Dan opened us up by speaking to the power of hope, people being hopeful, um, really working together toward a shared vision of the future. And this is a large part of that, um, really building a foundation for positive engagement by encouraging and supporting people to take positive action. So this, not only engages people, but it also sets the precedent for positive action while building relationships across different communities. Um, so we can look at an example out of um, Durham and Durham, North Carolina. This isn't quite as extreme as, as the last two examples, but I think provides um, a really beautiful picture of, of what this positive, proactive, coordinated action can look like. So um, the um, Church of Latter-day Saints um, had, they, they fast regularly and use the money they save fasting to um, buy food for, um, you know, immediate relief. Often this food um, goes to hurricane victims, other natural disaster victims. Um, when COVID hit, um, they really poured their resources into um, doing um, hunger relief in in the southeast. Or and the raw the Durham community um, often has a um, you know issues with hunger and food shortages. So um, the Church of Latter Day Saints really um, approached different faith leaders in the Durham area and along with a Presbyterian church and um, a Jewish aid organization, um, they distributed 10 truckloads or 460,000 pounds of food throughout Durham. And this um, was heralded by local media as really um, a beautiful win for the community um, and really a beautiful effort done in coordination by these different leaders and set the set the precedent for this positive um, coordination for relief efforts specifically around hunger and around COVID. Great. So the next priority is especially because we're in election cycle and because within election cycles when we're concerned about violence one of the factors that can contribute to it is mis and disinformation um, broadly but also about electoral processes specifically. And so in the face of, of mis and disinformation, especially when there are attempts to spread it around the election, it's important to be proactive in ensuring that people have the correct information and expectations. So we're not going to go into the nitty gritty recommendations here for countering misinformation. And again, there are some do's and don'ts for countering misinformation on the call. But I'll, I'll speak for a moment about work that I did in Kenya, which I mentioned briefly before, um, with Sisi Ni Amani, Kenya. Um, so we'll start tying some of these different threads together. Um, Sisi Ni Amani means we are peace, and it was the name of the organization. We really built a brand and leveraged Sisi Ni Amani as an identity with local chapters in different neighborhoods. This is the Sisi Ni Amani um, Korogocho chapter right here doing an event. So in their neighborhood, they had their local identity. They set positive norms. They took action. They started doing events in the community, did things like political debate. And as part of that proactive action, um, we engaged in really large scale efforts to proactively provide people with accurate information where we knew there would be mis and disinformation. The 2013 election cycle in Kenya was the first under a brand new constitution. This meant that people went from voting for three elected positions in the general election to voting for six elected positions. Not only that, 
but the country went through a brand new biometric voter registration process. And so there were a ton of rumors that you would be able to vote from a button in your house or vote with electronic machines when you got to the polling station, when the reality was that people would be casting votes on six different color-coded paper ballots, one per position. So there was a lot of mis- and that you wouldn't need your ID to show up at a polling station because you biometrically registered to vote. In fact, you did. So there was a lot of potential for mis- and disinformation to fuel rumors, to fuel tensions. What we did was we worked with local community leaders to identify and find out the types of rumors that they were already hearing and the type of misinformation that they were concerned about. We then went and got accurate information and packaged it in short text messages and were able to spread that proactive, correct information using a text messaging platform that we built and also through different community leaders. So we predicted the types of disinformation and instead of just responding to it, proactively provided people with everything that they needed to know to make sure that they were com confident, comfortable, and calm. And then we watched them through the process. If there were long lines, if there were questions emerging, all throughout election day and afterwards, we kept them informed about what was going on so that they could understand it. The last priority um, that we wanna mention here today um, which ties back to the first exercise that we did of mapping stakeholders. Um, and it's one of the reasons why building a resiliency network, um, you know, as we heard a moment of crisis can be the catalyst um, to bring people together, to start new conversations. Um, but it also forms the foundation for long-term work because one of the most important types of proactive action to take is to start to build trust within your community, between different groups and different communities where you are. So as a network, one of the things that you can do is start to collectively build trust um, across and between different groups and different audiences in your community. You can start showing up for each other in different ways. Um, that can be as simple as sharing information about the election process, sharing information that people need can be a way to show up for them. Um, but also as events emerge, starting to show up for each other, build that sense of trust and dependency. Um, start to have regular communication and touching base to learn what each other are seeing and, and about each other's needs and start to set norms of respect um, across and within communities. This can really, again, the more you can build trust ahead of an event, the better. And so we'll end here with another U.S. example, um, and it comes from Boston, following the, the Boston Marathon bombing, where there was a lot of effort to prevent the bombing from, from triggering further violence um, and from creating an enabling um, environment um, for the type of hateful and dangerous rhetoric that we were seeing targeting Muslim communities at that time and, and that um, specifically to ensure that that didn't emerge in the wake of the bombing but that instead people came together peacefully. So long before the 2013 bombing, the Islamic Center, uh, the Islamic Society of Boston Cultural Center had worked very hard to build strong relationships with other faith leaders, with other institutions, with local government, with law enforcement agencies, and with the media. And so it was not long, it was only within hours of the marathon attack that ISBCC was able to take a clear public stance against violence to open the mosque to stranded marathon participants and reach out to the local mayor's office. They helped ensure cross-group communication, especially after um, media reported that the bombers were linked to a sister organization of the center. Um, the center was able to respond to every media request it received, in part due to having engaged in prior media training, um, and they publicly called for community cooperation. They meanwhile worked within their community to host Know Your Rights trainings and set up a free hotline for legal assistance to community members who might be facing harassment. Um, they held a prayer vigil and had it featured in the Boston Globe to honor victims of the bombing. And then for the first Friday prayers after the attack, ISBCC was able to invite its network of interfaith leaders who, together with the press present who had been invited, made statements of unequivocal support for the Muslim community. And so they were able to do the successful response to manage a crisis and bring people that, to manage a crisis that really could have escalated targeting, could have escalated tension. And instead they were able to really leverage existing relationships, collaborate with different partners and, and turn this into a moment that really brought people uh, uh, together. So we'll move now into the last um, of our, our discussion questions and really use the remaining time to, to reflect, discuss, and then answer any questions um, at the end of this, this webinar that you might have. Um, but we really want to, 
to take this as a moment um, to, like we took the baby step before, start to think about what might action look like for each of us. So I'll let Sam explain a little bit further before we give you another moment of reflection. Yeah. Um, so again, um, I want to I want to take us back to the beginning, right? Um, and and just think, you know, how can we really prepare um, for p the potential for you know heightened tensions, um, potential for conflict, um, you know, ahead of this or in the midst of now this really um, contentious moment, right, around the election. Um, but again, like we've been saying throughout, um, a lot of these recommendations are really about laying the groundwork for long-term work. So they have this um, immediate applicability, um, but also really, um, you know, are actions that will serve long-term community building and, and long-term resilience. So, so in this this baby step approach, and I know like this. Our time is limited. Um, I want to just remind everyone that we're very much approaching this as a beginning and not, you know, an end. We don't expect anyone to have a completed plan by the time we finish this webinar. So um, I hope that's helpful. Um, we really want to now move toward um, folks, you know, developing a baby step plan of action for when they get off this call. Um, so thinking through, um, you know, what concrete actions you can take with your networks that exist as, you know, you continue to build your networks, um, like we talked about during the first, first exercise, what is an action you can take now? So one concrete action I can take now to take proactive action is to fill in the blank. To do this, I will work with fill in the blank. The resources I will need are fill in the blank. And this can really just serve as a jumping off point to think about the different ways you can take proactive action, um, you know, with the network that you have, again, while you continue to build your network in the ways that we talked about at the beginning of this presentation. So we will take um, three minutes again to just reflect on this. Um, you know, you can use the last, the last few slides as a general guide for how to structure the proactive action you're thinking about, you know, disseminating accurate information, building, um, unifying identities, building trust across relationship or across communities, um, setting positive norms, really thinking through all those pieces and thinking about how that can apply, um, you know, even at the most micro level um, within your community. So um, I'll stop talking now and we can take uh, three minutes to uh, just think through this and then we will do another facilitated share back.
right? I think we can start wrapping up. All right, I will turn it back to Dan. Thanks, Sam. Um, a lot of great, a lot of really good action steps coming through in the chat. Um, so I would direct everyone's attention uh, to those when you get a second to look, but also want to strongly encourage folks to raise your hand uh, so that we can activate your mic and you can share live and we can have some give and take. That's really, a, really the, the best way to share. So um, so please, please speak out and uh, the Kelsey toolkit from Faith in Public Life, as well as this full toolkit. Um, there are links, and again, they'll go out um, by email as well. And I also see um, a, a question about what would be a couple of questions to ask new people we're connecting with. Um, and I think this is a really great question. And I want to point out that actually um, in the toolkit, if you look at that step one, we actually have some outreach questions to really start to ask people uh, to really go in with a listening frame of mind and start to ask the different groups and stakeholders that you're reaching out to. Um, what is it that you um, care about? What are you seeing? What are the issues of concern for you? What do you see as our core sources of resilience? Um, what would you want to get out of being part of a network like this? And so we do have some guiding questions that can help frame up some of those conversations and make it a little bit easier, at least use as a sort of a template as a starting point. Um, there's another couple of questions that I think it would be good um, to address. Somebody asked, uh, will I be allowed to show this webinar in its entirety to a group of local leaders? The answer is absolutely. And um, all the tools in the toolkit are, are, you know, they're handouts, but you can use them on a webinar. You can have people reflect, share in the chat and really get things going. And our goal today, um, because you look at the toolkit, it's extensive, is to help you understand how to go through it and pick the different activities most relevant to you, um, because there's a lot of worksheets and tools in there, but also to know that it's as simple as starting to think about who can I really connect to, right? That's what's at the heart of it, is how can I connect to a lot of different people in my community who have access to different knowledge, different capacities, different reach, so that we can be ready uh, to really work together. Um, so everything will be accessible. You can feel absolutely free to use this webinar and this toolkit to start conversations and spark action. And you, we will also want you to feel really free as you're doing so to be reaching out with questions. Um, we're, we're always in touch um, with Kelsey and Dan and the Faith and Public Life team. And so our team at Over Zero is also here um, to support and, and answer as well. Rachel, a question and Sam that I see is for folks who are worried about a lot of groups already existing or a lot of meetings that are already happening, is this about starting something new? This is about working with what the community has. How would you um, answer that? Yeah, um, I would say, no, you don't have to start from scratch. Um, you know, you're already so connected. I think um, people, people don't think of their networks um, being quite as robust as they are until they really sit down and start thinking about it and start mapping out who it is that they know, who, they, who it is they're connected to. And um, like Rachel said, you know, in the toolkit itself, we have a number of worksheets for really working through and mapping out so you can, so you can really get a better sense of who your network already is. Um, so no, I mean, I, I would, highly doubt that you need to start from scratch. I think you already have so many relationships in place, again, just by the nature of your position as, as a faith leader and someone who is engaged in this work. It's about, in this moment, it's about, um, you know, thinking about what your bandwidth is, what your capacity is, um, and do you have the bandwidth and capacity to either uh, deepen these relationships, um, to reach out to these initial groups like we talked about and like Rachel said, we have some initial um, outreach questions. Um, you know, it's about folks doing what they're able to do. And um, we're not saying you have to do all of these things, right? This is the whole world of possibilities of what you can do. Um, and it's what you have the capacity and the bandwidth for. So if that means, you know, with three or four of your peers, um, organizing some sort of coordinated action, great. 
if that means you're connected to um, 20 other faith leaders um, and you want to broaden that network, great. It's about what you're positioned to do right now. Again, being very aware of, you know, all the commitments that we all have, but also the fact that, that we are um, now really in election season. So two things. Uh, one is I want to point out that uh, somebody in chat was just asking, oh, is there anybody else from Richmond in here? That's an action step. I love that folks are looking for local allies uh, who are on this as well. Just wanted to affirm that and say that that's the exact kind of right impulse. The Your thinking cap is well fitted um, for that. And Elise, uh, you are back. Uh, your, your, um, your microphone is back unmuted if you would like to share out more or, or ask another question. Well, so I guess I have a very basic question and maybe we're not ready to go there, but I did read about and someone put into one of the questions about the militia attempt to kidnap the governor in, I think it was Michigan today. Um, and I guess I'm just wondering how we think about what it is that we're preparing for. Um, and that is a big question that we probably don't have time to go into. But when I speak to people, um, am I talking about, you know, uh, demonstrations in the street or violence of a level that we haven't seen before? Um, I guess I'm just asking for some prognostication of some type. Yeah, I can give a a quick answer to that. Um, and I see a few other um, questions too. It's a great point. And um, of course we see in the news today, this unfortunately seems to only be becoming more and more relevant right now. A couple of things to point out. I think one of the, the pieces we talked about in the opening framing is that when we have risk factors for political violence, part of the challenge is that we don't know exactly what we're preparing for. There's a whole range of scenarios that could emerge. And the question we have to ask ourselves is what's the infrastructure and what's the response capacity that we need that's gonna enable us and allow us to respond across a range of scenarios to mitigate harm, to prevent violence, to ensure that in the wake of something as awful as a militia group planning to kidnap a governor, as awful as a hate crime or whatever it might be, there is a network of leaders that is able to reach across a community and across a society and say, this is, this is not who we want to be. This is how we're going to act and set. This is what we're going to do to repair and to heal. And we're going to set these positive norms and we're going to be in it together. So when we see extreme violence happen, when we see um, extreme rhetoric, dangerous rhetoric start to gain a foothold in our political discourse, these are all signs of real risk and risk that could become much worse. And again, the characteristic of this type of situation um, is that there is a level of uncertainty of exactly what it is that we are preparing for. Even if we can predict a range of types of events, we might not get it just right. There's a lot of things. No one could have predicted that on this day, we're gonna find out that exactly this happened in Michigan, right? Um, I think we're all in this feeling day by day of, wait, this has happened, that's happened. Um, in international contexts where there's risk of violence, um, we have, there's their long-term efforts to set up what we call early warning and response mechanisms, right? These are very formalized um, relationships and networks like the ones that we're talking about that have the ability to detect risks, to see what's happening and to respond across a range of scenarios. Given um, the moment that we're in and the type of escalation and increasing risk that we're seeing, what we're really suggesting here is that starting to build these relationships and these conversations is going to put you in a better position to be able to respond across the range of scenarios that might emerge and to ask at least what in this scenario do we have that we can bring to the table that's going to move us a little bit away from violence, it's going to mitigate harm, it's going to show up for our neighbors. And so um, I see also a question about national um, and uh, sorry, state, national organizations laddered up um, from these sort of local initiatives. And the thing is that we need it to happen at all levels. So if you have an initiative in your community, connecting to a national organization like Faith and Public Life can mean that you get connected to someone doing similar work elsewhere to share best practices, can mean that you, um, you find out about a mediation organization that may be able to help or a de-escalation training or all of these different resources that are available. So um, the point is not that we need action only at one level, but the point is to start, um, you know, especially I think as faith leaders in a community being able to say, what are my connections? 
what is my, um, the sort of social capital and the standing and the leadership role that I play in my community to start making these connections and having these conversations. And then we would suggest to look for the different um, state level efforts, national level efforts that you can connect to to bring in even more capacities. Um, and so um, I hope that that, that that answers your question. We could go, I'm trying to keep myself from going down the rabbit hole there and, uh, and, and getting too in depth, but for what happened today, it becomes even that much more important that people see people from all across Michigan, from all across the country saying, um, you know, standing up against violence and, and starting to promote a different set of norms and a different way to engage in this moment. Um, because the real danger there is that that comes to be perceived as normal and accepted. Um, and, and that's where we can get into even more trouble. I see Nancy is unmuted. Thank you. Um, so yesterday I was on a webinar with the Texas Civil Rights Project and um, you know, we were talking about ways in which to mitigate against voter suppression and especially at polling places. And, you know, I think there's a pretty good chance that, you know, maybe even on the first, especially given what's going on in Texas, that there's a good chance that, you know, even on the first day of voting, of early voting, you could find armed people um, provoking um, skirmishes and there could be a really tragic situation early on. And I just wonder, and, and of course, an African American lawyer on the group said, well, you know, we're just going to encourage people to keep on voting because we've seen worse than this before. And it was a definitely, you know, to Raymond's point, um, you know, very good corrective to my concerns in a certain way. But are there specific groups that are training, for example, poll monitors, in what to do if some kind of violence actually erupts. I mean, I, we can de-escalate, um, you know, and I guess this is, it's sort of the um, extreme of the escalation. We've got about two minutes till closing, so I'm gonna take a quick answer at that, though of course we could do a whole webinar on it. We actually have been talking to a few of those types of poll monitoring organizations. We. The, the main recommendation for them, because de-escalation takes a ton of training um, and there's a lot of, um, of work that goes into being prepared, is rather than having, um, having people get you know, a few hour training virtually and then try and show up and de-escalate in a situation like that, the question is, um, is both about having a plan to mitigate harm if someone does show up to a polling station, but to know that in this type of situation, part of political violence is that it wants to shape who can participate in, who can benefit from political, socio-cultural life. Um, and I think that that part of what we know about this type of violence of, of intimidation is that it's meant to coerce. It's meant to influence whether or not people vote, right? And so we have to remember that that type of violence is symbolic. It's sending a signal rather than solely um, impacting its immediate victims. When stories and narratives of that type of violence begin to circulate, um, they, they start to fuel intimidation, right? So once there's a story about people showing up um, at polls with guns, it serves to intimidate even more voters to make them uh, feel even more afraid to show up to vote. And so I think there's a couple of questions here about how do we mitigate those harms. And there's a few things that we've talked about. One is being proactive, um, making it a less permissive environment for an armed actor to show up by doing things like proactively getting diverse community leaders to show up distanced with their signs saying, thank you for showing up to vote. We're so proud of X neighborhood for voting, right? So start to build that. And especially if it's, um, you know, it makes it bad optics for, for, for those folks to show up with guns if, if they're um, having to go up against an organized um, orderly group of um, high, like uh, community leaders perceived as having some level of status. So there's sort of the preventative proactive mobilization work that you can do to create a safe environment at the polling station. But then if something does happen and if that story starts to circulate, making sure that you're connecting to community leaders um, from the community that's been targeted to ask what do you think that needs to happen for your community to feel safe to continue voting or for this neighborhood to feel safe to continue voting our city to people in our city to feel safe to continue voting mobilizing that sort of safety effort alongside um, what other, whatever um, sort of city or, or other efforts are happening um, to, uh, to to create 
a safe environment for people to show up to vote, to encourage people to vote, to set norms and say in our community, we care that everyone has a chance to vote. We care that our neighbors have a chance to vote, really asserting that norm with different leaders, faith leaders, business leaders, et cetera. Um, and, and again, responding to the needs of whatever communities are, are, are most impacted and what they would like to see. Um, and, and so I'll, there's a lot more to see there. I'll stop now because we're at time. But I really want to point out, I, I will say I am so um, amazed at the level of conversations um, that's happening here and the thinking that's already happening just within an hour and a half of spending some time together to start thinking. And so I want to encourage everyone. Um, obviously, these are tools and, and part of the reason you all are so well positioned um, to do this work and, and to have all of these ideas is because of the work you've already been doing. Um, and so um, just want to say how glad we are to be able to support in any way and that uh, we'll be here for um, for ongoing support through the toolkit and, and any other way. So I'm so grateful to all of you for spending the time together. Great. Rachel, thank you so much uh, for your time and your expertise um, and everybody uh, who's chimed in today. Nancy, uh, thank you for, for chiming in as well. I wanted to add one quick detail to what Rachel said is that like when you're showing up uh, that way and, you know, at, at polls or, or any situation like that, if your appearance conveys that you are a faith leader, that's hugely helpful. If you are a pastor, you know, like whatever you would preach in basically, or whatever, like whatever attire communicates faith leader within your tradition, wearing that is very important. It can convey in a photo or a video what's happening. Uh, it can make the other side think about how bad they would look attacking you uh, to, be, to be really crass about it. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to add that detail on top of what Rachel uh, said and turn it over to Kelsey real quick, uh, just for a quick note on next steps. Uh, and then it'll be time for us to part ways for the day. And thanks everyone for giving us an extra few minutes. Thanks everybody so much. And Rachel, Sam and Dan. So you're gonna receive an email uh, tomorrow with the recording of this video. Uh, we'll also record last, um, the first Preventing Violence webinar, as well as the full toolkit from Over Zero and also Over Zero's rapid response messaging toolkit. Uh, the link that I've put, uh, current, uh, the Faith in Public Life link, if you scroll down just a little bit, there where you will find the first webinar if you're really eager. And so I've seen lots of great questions like, can I share this broadly? The answer is yes. Um, please share it. Uh, consider who you want to bring in. There was so much incredible conversation happening. So we encourage that to continue. Um, really thank you over zero for your expertise. Um, and everything you know, you're doing to protect our communities, our democracy. Um, it's a blessing to be in this work with you. So thank you, everybody, and be on the lookout. And feel free to forward that to everybody um, that you want to bring into this work. So um, have a great night or great afternoon, and we'll connect again soon.